everybody, and welcome to this most amazing episode of the I Hate Matt Wall Poetry Podcast, where I finally got Australia's most famous poet, Alice Allen, on the show. And let's see if we could keep that going, make that a thing. You guys know what I'm saying? All right. So Alice Allen is the host of the amazing podcast Poetry Says, okay, that is very Australian-centric, but, as you will hear in this episode, tends to drift out into the rest of the world, okay? So, and this is a long one, and yes, that is what she said. So um, I'm going to try to make this part short and sweet. So again, poems about fucking. It's out now on my Etsy shop. Links down below. You should go get it. Poetic Anarchy Volume 3 is out now on the Zon. Links down below. Or just go on Amazon and look for it. But the most hugest and importantest thing in the world is your mom is finally here. Yes. You are looking or maybe just listening to because you're a cheap ass. But you are listening to the winner of your mom's sodomy prize for poetry. This guy with two thumbs. Now, the links for the pre-order crowdfunding campaign of awesome will be down below. Now, some of you might be going, well, why do I have to pre-order a book? Why don't I just fucking get it when the book comes out? Because I need you guys to pre-order the book so I can see how awesome I can make the book. So in order to do these things, there are tons of perks that you will get. You can get things like a bunch of my chapbooks, um, all my other paperbacks, audiobooks. You could get March's... Um, chapbook runner-up that is only going to be available to those who get stuff in the crowdfunding campaign for your mom okay and speaking of your mom other things include me writing a special note to your mom i'm gonna do that okay you can also get an 8 by 10 glossy photo of me on the toilet signed and if you want to give that to your mom you can or you can keep it, hang it up. There's gonna be stickers. And then I'm also gonna be just giving you random books I have too. So if you guys just like it and random crap, you want some of my t-shirts? Not even ones that say anything about me, just shirts that I have that I don't want anymore. I'm gonna be throwing all sorts of crap your guys' way. If you guys like getting boxes of crap, your mom is the man. You see what I'm saying here? So links for this will be down below. It's only going for 30 days. And after 30 days, whatever we raise, that's going to be the quality of the book that comes out. So don't fuck this up for me and don't fuck this up for you. You know what to do. You know what's right. You know how to do it. So click the link down below. Pick your prize. Pick your poison and do the right thing. And then tell all of your friends and maybe even your mom about it. And, and that'll be splendid. So... Now I need to actually do the shout outs real quick before I forget. So I want to give a big thank you to my motherfuckers over on Patreon. I want to give a thank you to Chase, to Michael, to Deborah, to Cedar, to Harry. You guys are awesome. I love you. I want to give a thank you to the thank you crew over on the YouTubes, to Patrick, to Britt, to JH, to Jan. You guys are awesome. Thank you so much. I want to give a big thank you to the swinging pendulums inside the grandfather clock. A big thank you to Bunny, to Nate, to Mindy, to Hannah, to Thomas, to Tim J, to Lisa, to Josh, to Shaylin, to Caitlin, to Tim G, to Jessica, and to Tamara, or it might be Tamara, if you let me know today then maybe I'll say it right tomorrow. And to Chill Baby, thank you guys so much. You guys are awesome. I love you. And finally, the biggest of the swinging pendulums over in the Chapbook of the Month Club to the number one chappy. I want to give a big thank you to the SDG. Thank you so much. So with all that said, 
let's get into the meat of the sandwich, which we call a poetry podcast. First off, where are you in the world? So people know. I'm in Melbourne, Australia. Was voted for a number of years the world's most livable city. I don't think we hold that title anymore. But it, yeah, it's pretty what great place to What did you do? I think just some Scandi city stole it from oh, us okay. by having like slightly better public transport. Oh, well, that would probably do it. Because you're not yeah. from Melbourne, right? No, I'm from uh, the capital, Canberra, which is the world's most boring city. So did it switch when you moved over there? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was all about me. <laughs> I am solely responsible. Yeah, you bring six point days to That's Melbourne. right, that's yeah, right. All right. Six out of ten. God damn it. All right. <laughs> <laughs> How did you get into not just reading poetry, but writing poetry? These are all the softball questions. Softballs. I got into writing poetry through creative envy of a friend of mine who was writing more than I was. I didn't like that at all. And people had been telling me my whole life that, oh, Alice, you should be a poet. You're a poet. And I'm like, yeah, I totally am. And then I just didn't write anything until I was like 25. So what was your teenage years like then if you weren't writing before that? I think I, I wrote a lot of poems for and about my best friend, who's also called Alice, who I was very, very obsessed with. And so I suppose I was writing poetry of a sort, but Mm -hmm. it was more just like, just to get it out. You don't think any of that has any merit or anything like that? Like you would never Uh, put a book out of your (laughs) high school stuff. Probably goes into the category of you are a stalker. You need mental help. Oh my gosh. So basically like all of my stuff. Got it. <laughs> oh no, that's no judgment on. I mean, just, no, no, no. I was I'm 14. Just... <laughs> Some of us still are. It's okay. I was just joking uh... about that. Mid twenties, you start writing. When did you start taking it seriously when you were doing it? Uh, I think I was pretty serious from the start I really wanted to achieve a lot with it and I had some early successes that gave me a lot of confidence and then I pretty quickly hit a ceiling and started getting some pretty major knockbacks and then I slowed right down because what do you think what do you think caused that I was just aiming a little higher where I was sending stuff to and I was nowhere near ready for them to publish it and so had to slow down. I still think I went a little bit too fast, but I was very driven. I was keeping spreadsheets and lists and dates and all that stuff. Spreadsheets are awesome. I love spreadsheets. Yeah. <laughs> I'm all about spreadsheets. Do you feel like you were having, before you started like punching above your weight kind of thing, do you feel like you were kind of like a big fish in a small pond kind of thing? Yeah, I thought I was pretty great and like so basically a genius. And uh, yeah, then started getting these knockbacks and I was like, oh, wait, there are other people out there who are also writing poetry and some of them are a lot better than me. I know that like none of what I'm saying here fits at all with the Matt Wall ethos and I feel like I'm just no, giving no, you no, ammo. No. Like... <laughs> You're like, okay, Alice. basically how this works is I'm going to ask you a bunch of questions. You're going to answer uh-huh. them wrong and then I'm yeah, going to start gonna yell at me. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. It's just, I, I find it really interesting. Like what external factors change someone's outlook on their own work okay let me ask you this when you were sending your stuff out that was getting rejected when you were sending it out you thought you were a genius right (laughs) I think that that myth got shattered pretty quickly but but yeah I had a pretty big ego for sure I was like thought I was pretty good so when you got those rejections Mm. those rejections kind of told you that you weren't what you thought you were right exactly yeah and you agree with that correct I probably have a slightly more nuanced view on it now because it's like well it's not that I was terrible I was just a baby poet and that's Mm -hmm. okay like I was just going a bit too fast yeah Um, I think it's really common and just what you do in the first couple of years is you know there are these journals and you want to get into them and you kind of want to get into them yesterday. Mm -hmm. So you just don't necessarily read enough. That was my biggest thing was that I really hadn't read anything to speak of before I started writing. And I wrote for a lot of years without really reading at all. And it was really only once I started the show that I started reading seriously because I had to. That's super interesting. When you thought you were like top tier stuff, you also (laughs) weren't reading anything, right? Exactly. I was totally naive. And living is, in this is bubble. That, 
Is that being naive though? Is well, that what that I, is? I didn't have, I hadn't read anything. I didn't have a community around me because I was living mm -hmm. in the world's most boring city. And okay. I, yeah, I had no reference points. So I was just like, whatever goes onto the page for me, that's great. And then it would come back and but and you then were the getting thing accepted is, before that, right? Yeah, but a very, um, the kind of stuff that it's like really, you couldn't really get rejected from. It would be hard. But the thing is too, once you, if you send stuff out to journals, often there's a lag of about two, three months more. Uh, and then yeah. the poem comes back and you look at it again and you're like, oh God, this is embarrassing. <laughs> When you said you did everything too fast, like, what do you mean by that? How much time does someone need to spend not doing what you did? Uh, I would never make any rules around it, though. I, I can only talk from my own experience. And yeah. yeah, I wasn't giving any of the poems enough time to sit and for me to see, could later recognize my flaws. Or just that probably this poem is a stepping stone poem. It's the poem I need to write to get to the next one, which is okay. going to be better. Because I just wanted the thrill of the acceptance. You know, yeah. it was whenever I would get one, and sometimes I'd get like a little bit of money, like 40 bucks or something, and I would call my best friend down the road and I'll be like I got a poem accepted but we got to go and have dinner with my poetry money and we would that's, so rad. <laughs> that's awesome yeah so you do all this and you hit a bunch of ceilings and stuff and then you break through that right yes I so guess how did that, that go probably, uh well I got into a journal based down here called rabbit and um it was pretty new I think it was the third or fourth issue that I got into. And that was around the time that I moved down here to Melbourne. I went to the launch and got to hear people reading their own work and just be in a poetry community for the first time. And so start to get some of those reference points and start to realize that like there was a whole world down here of people who are writing and reading and talking and thinking about this stuff. I think I still thought that, you know, success was only probably a couple of months away mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, kept probably sending stuff out a bit too quickly for another little while and then probably hit another ceiling. I suppose there's always another ceiling. You know what I'm saying? Damn multiple story buildings, right? I know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. The house okay. of poetry is a high rise. Yeah. <laughs> In New York. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So when did your first chat book come out? That only came out really recently at the end of 2019. And then really soon after that, kind of on top of it, my first collection came out at the start of 2020. And is that the one that came out right when COVID hit? Yes. Yeah. So I didn't get to have my, my beautiful launch where I was going to wear my beautiful dress and have everybody just adore me. <laughs> That didn't happen. <laughs> now, um, I've heard you talk a little bit about it on your amazing show, but are launch parties for books a really big thing in Australia? Yeah, I heard another poet describe it as like, it's kind of like a wedding for the poet. Oh, <laughs> Especially really? Especially the first book. It's like, but I mean, you know, that's only for the poet. I think everybody else there is like, oh God, another launch. Oh, okay. Who's reading at this one? Especially in Melbourne, honestly, you can go to a launch twice a week quite easily at that some points of the year it's um, really yeah you know, people just publish so much stuff and you got to go and you got to be seen and talk to the right people and do that like over the shoulder conversation and it's really tiring so that becomes um, like yeah. a part of the job right like yeah, going yeah, yeah. to all these things like is this just networking or do you have to go in order to like run into the right editors and stuff like that. I don't know. To be honest, like maybe it doesn't matter at all. Maybe it, I, I don't actually think it makes a concrete difference. I think maybe I have this like belief that if I don't go, somebody will notice and think something bad about me. But honestly, that's bullshit. I'm not that important. <laughs> no one's going to notice if I'm there or not. And more I lately, about... I, no, I really, I really don't think so. But lately I've been kind of, I've been going to more things and actually having a good time because I've been able to let down down a bit of the defenses and just actually interact with people yeah. as like peers and friends and just be like, you know, these people are not turning around to the person next to them and being like, oh, fucking Alice Allen's here. What a loser. Like they want, they want to they talk to me. Say that. Of course they do. <laughs> do you run into like, I mean, have you made any connections going to these? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got like people who I would call like more than acquaintances my test for like if you're a friend it's like would you help me move house oh, none no. of them are in that category no. <laughs> <laughs> but like good acquaintances like people I can stand up the back of the reading with and like throw looks at when there's a bad yeah. poem or like laugh with when there's a good poem 
That's really good. That's cool. Yeah, it's really nice to feel like a bit because for so long I was just like, these people are way too cool for me because I'm from Canberra and they're from Melbourne. And lately I've just kind of been like, I was totally excluding myself for no good reason. Like, is there a big cultural divide between the two? Like, does I mean, Melbourne look down on it? You know, Melbourne wouldn't give a second thought about a camera. It's just like, it's a country town, essentially. Yeah. It's like, does LA look down on, oh gosh, what's like a tiny American city? Help me out. It doesn't matter because no one from LA is from LA. Ah, like okay. Like LA is just where everyone kind of ends up to die kind of thing. Oh, that's that's beautiful. That's yeah. great. Yeah. <laughs> that's kind of, great that's first kind line. Of exactly how it is. Like, <laughs> I think East Coast, it's a lot different. Like mm. East Coast, like different parts of New York have certain thoughts about other parts of New York, but then all parts of New York have certain thoughts about, I don't know, Baltimore. And then like Baltimore has certain thoughts about what's further South and yeah, all yeah, that yeah. kind of stuff. But well, yeah, here, I just, I feel like it's really hard to run into someone who lives in LA, who was born in LA. Is the publisher who put out your chat, book the same that put out your other book you put out? No, two different publishers. The one that put out my chapbook weirdly approached me and said, would you like to do a chapbook with us? Which I just still cannot fathom what went on there. But You're a big deal. (laughs) Can you laugh? That's funny. (laughs) No, you're a big deal. Okay. And then with the other one, how did you do that? Did you like submit for it? I did. I submitted it to Jess at Rabbit and it was the only place I submitted And the day that she sent me the email that said, yes, let's do it. I felt like nothing could touch me. One of the best moments of my life, honestly. Yeah. First place she sent it to. Yeah. Which is, which is not, I mean, I had put manuscripts, heavy quotes on that, like mishmash collections of about 40 pages in like competitions and stuff a few times. Mm -hmm. Again, thinking like still this massive ego, just being like, oh yeah, this is great. And then of course the person who wins it. You're like, oh, yes, okay, that makes sense. I'd had a few runs at it, but this was the first really serious. Like, I went away to a residency, they had magnetic walls, and I like put all the poems up on the walls. So awesome, it was so good. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Mm. See, the thing about LA that's kind of strange is that it's really big. Most metropolitan areas in America are super condensed and very tall, Mm. and LA is like like someone just vomited on the ground and it like went everywhere (laughs) kind of thing. So like there's stuff that you might be able to go to, but it's like an hour away. And so, and that's without traffic. And so like, then people start going, well, you know, there's traffic. I don't know if I want to, do I really want to go across town at six o'clock? Oh, it's going to be a nightmare and all this other stuff. And so pretty soon you just have these little pockets of things that happen Yeah, and the people on the other side of the town or even down the street have no idea it's even happening. Yeah, you yeah, know what yeah, I'm yeah. saying? It's yeah, just it's do. it's so weird. Mm-hmm. And when I hear about all these places that have these amazing, like thriving scenes and stuff, it's like really exciting. No, um, I feel exceptionally <laughs> lucky to live in a city like Melbourne that has like a true yeah, places where poetry is read and and thought about and cared about and people who do those things. I'm super lucky. So from there, with you being the luckiest person alive, to (laughs) even being so lucky, you're only having a six day, which I'm offended by a little bit right now, but that's all right. Oh, no. No, (laughs) no, 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 it's okay. It's all right. I understand completely. No, I'm just kidding. Um, But how did the podcast start? So I started the podcast when we had moved to London with my partner's work and I was very lonely and probably one of the worst times in my life for depression that I have ever had. And I think this is probably something that you can relate to. Like when I'm like that, the only thing that seems to make sense is work. Mm -hmm. I just want to work harder. I'd always adored the podcast that I listened to, the people on those shows feel like, I don't know, some kind of weird family slash husbands or something. I don't know. Mm -hmm. (laughs) It's like they, they, um, yeah, they really really close to them because it's very so close to them. You feel so, you know, this is people in your ears and they just whisper to you and it's lovely. Yeah. They'd really got me through some exceptionally hard times and it wasn't one of those, you know, altruistic things of like, maybe I can help other people. It was just like, I'm really lonely. I love podcasts. 
fuck it. Did you have any goals set it, like set for doing it other than you just needed something to do? The goal was to keep going. Kind of reminds me of the journal I mentioned before, Rabbit. When we went to the launch of the fourth Rabbit, Jess turned to me and was like, we made it. Like we did more than three because everything stops at like three and podcasts. I feel like it's 10 episodes. <laughs> Most people get to 10. <laughs> Don't nine. you love like scrolling like through yeah. and being like seeing these dead shows, like with these huge concepts. What drives them? me crazy is that the fucking poetry foundation has like 37 podcasts yeah, and only two shit. of them have like gone past or like, I don't know, like no one's been updating the other ones since 2017. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, yeah. why are you doing this? Okay. It's but yeah, weird, sorry. isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And you know, I think there's sometimes there's a good reason for a limited series, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, for me, it was just like, I measure success differently than I used to, you know, it's less about um, breaking through the next ceiling and more just about persistence and yeah. so yeah I feel good when I get to a next the next round number yeah longevity and persistence is like whether it's you're in a band or making movies or writing books or doing anything like if you keep doing that thing people have to look at you you know yeah so just know funny, that people yeah. have to stare at you now they have to stare <laughs> at you through their ears that's happening. That's right. That's right. <laughs> okay. So what episode number was it when you realized that your show was more than just the thing keeping you company? So I think that's happened a couple of times. It's had a number of different lives. When I made the episode that was just me and my friend voice messaging each other. Yeah. Which, which is called Nonsense and Crying, episode 152. I mean, in many ways, that's an expression of like a terrible time in both our lives, but also it just was this moment of like, I can do whatever the fuck I want here. Nobody cares. But probably <laughs> well, no one's going to get me in trouble. Let me rephrase it that way. But then probably the other one that I, I, I first started to hear from people was funnily enough, episode 69, Earn Mally. When I talked about Earn great. Mally. That was great. Oh, thank you. That's like yeah. one of my favorite ones. Cause like thank you. you are to me, the, the most famous poet in Australia. <laughs> And so like, <laughs> I know you and right. I know all of the things you do and you read poems on your show and you do the whole thing. But the Earn Mally thing, that was like seriously one of the coolest things that has ever happened. And I'm mad that it doesn't happen every three days. <laughs> that should be yeah. constantly happening. And I'm just like, oh. And then I was kind of bummed out at how anticlimactic it ended. Like, I was really hoping for some, like, it just sounded like a movie when you were talking about it, you know? And then it was just like, and then, like, they were at a bar, and this guy got mad, and then he left, and that was it. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, my God, that's like... <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose in a way, like, the Earn Mally story just never ends for Australian poetry. We're still living with the ghost of Mally, and he is like a real person. I went to his mm -hmm. 101st birthday reading a couple of years ago. <sighs> that like, is so awesome. Yeah, it was great. You know, like Mally very much lives on. So yeah, it's an epic story. Do you, like with the whole idea behind it and the like almost satire of the whole thing, mm. do you feel like the poetry, the, the poetic industrial complex, let's say, do you think they've learned their lesson from that or no? Mm, I don't know whether they have learned a lesson, but there's a real, there's a real shadow there. There's a lack of an ability to take ourselves completely seriously because we fell for this. Mm -hmm. There's a feeling of like foolishness maybe that persists. I think it's a really healthy thing. I think without Mali, uh, Australian poetry looks worse in all kinds of different ways. So do you think Australian poetry lives in a shadow of having to not take itself seriously because of fear of that? Oh, yeah, maybe not. Maybe I can walk that back a bit and just say like for some poets, um, because there are still many poets that really do take themselves super fucking seriously. Well, who's that? Pull the Hope? shit out of me. <laughs> Eddie Hope. Eddie Hope and... Um, Oh God, just, just so many, just so many. When you first started having guests on, were you doing that in the sense of, oh, this will be fun that I get to talk to people? 
or did you have any kind of um i don't want to say ulterior motive but like in doing the show and doing the interviews like how has that helped push your career oh it's, in poetry? it's essential like yeah there's no point like mincing words about it like you have to have i had to have the guests on i had no name or reputation at all so every big guest every big fish is a massive win those are mm -hmm. the episodes that get the big download numbers like you just you just got to keep doing it and I suppose the struggle that I have these days is like from one angle I have publishers sometimes saying would you like to interview this person then there are the people I'm truly interested in and then there are the big names who would get me downloads and cred but who I don't necessarily want to talk to because a lot of the times I fucking hate them Mm -hmm. so just trying to balance that is tricky and I don't know that I've fully cracked it yet that didn't really answer your question at all but that is what's been on my mind <laughs> yeah no but like how many of the big fish we'll say in Australia how many of the big fish have you not captured yet that you've tried <laughs> big Australian fish um there's there's heaps there's like kind of big guys from history and then there's big contemporary people some of them I just I don't I don't want to speak to because they seem like awful people mm -hmm. and it's like yeah this would be you know and I had one the other day where the publisher was like oh do you want to talk to this person and I'm like well that's a door that hasn't been opened to me before I've tried a couple of times in the past yeah. and I've got to know it? and now I'm now I'm getting an offer but I don't want to talk to them <laughs> so so, you're not so I said no oh, I'm not gonna do it Look at you. You yeah. are the person rejecting people now. You are oh, that person. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, dude, it has totally turned. It. <laughs> you are the one breaking people's hearts. Whoever that guy is, he's like, oh, man, I thought I was a genius. And now, like, I hit a fucking glass ceiling <laughs> and it's a podcast. <laughs> no, I, I doubt that that he's aware it's just this thing of like I think people can really tell when you are being dishonest in an interview and I've definitely recorded interviews with people who I just didn't like and whose work I didn't like and I I you know I just sit there for two hours and edit them back and it sucks mm -hmm. to hear your voice when you're just like oh so tell me about your blah 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 and it's like well yeah you don't care they don't care why is any any of us here you know well maybe right this now. is a good segue into our first communication if this is something that uh, you yes. want to talk about sure yeah I'm, I, yeah let's do it okay so yeah. this is basically how to not talk to people especially the first time. <laughs> Okay, so I, because freaking Bucks over there in his damn Slee Ricket show, was so excited to get a drunken rant email from me, I thought that since you were a part of the crew, that you would also enjoy a drunken rant email from me. So, oh, that makes sense. <laughs> so <laughs> I... I was listening to your show, and there's, seriously, there's only been, like, out of the gajillion episodes you have there's probably only been like two or three where i was like really like what is this what's happening and i ran into one of these episodes and i wrote you a ridiculous ranty email that i felt really good about when i sent it and then the next <laughs> morning i was like did i come off a little too harsh let me read the email and then I read it and I'm like, oh my God, this is a bit rough. And then I wrote you and I'm like, well, the only way to fix this is if I actually talk to the person who I was talking shit on. So I wrote that person and sent them the same email I sent you. And then at the beginning of the email, I said like, hey, just so you know, I was really pissed off at shit you said and all this other shit. I'm like, but maybe I was wrong. So I want to give you the benefit of the doubt. And I sent that to him and he never replied to me. So that's fine. But um, you replied to me. And because you are so polite and proper, <laughs> at the end of the email, you said, I really hope you take care of yourself, Matt. Oh, and yeah, I was I like, that. and I was like, <laughs> oh man. And I'm like listening. And as I was reading it, I'm like, oh, that's about as like yelly at me as she's going to get. I fucked up. <laughs> <laughs> 
that's not that's not where that was coming from at all but I see how you got there yeah oh yeah then I felt really bad about it so um so just so you guys know if one person likes drunken rant emails in the middle of the night that doesn't mean everyone likes those (laughs) even if those people are friends (laughs) <laughs> so how was that when you got that email from me it's it's a little bit hard to remember honestly like I I don't remember it being like a particular like shock or, or concern or anything I think my only thing was like I do have this thing about my guests mm-hmm. where I feel even if like I don't agree with what they're saying and I, I wonder if you feel this way, way as well because you probably get all kinds of different feedback on your mm-hmm. guests but like I sort of feel like when you interview somebody there's an exchange that happens and and I often come away from from any interview, I'm sure I'll feel this today, feeling like quite attached to that person, you know. Yay. It's the same as like when I used to perform on stage, like you mm-hmm. do a scene with someone and then it's like, we did that, mm-hmm. you know. For Maybe real. it was shit, but like we did that together. And so I think I was a bit like, it wasn't for me. It was just like, oh, no, like I, I hope that um, the guest isn't like rattled because he doesn't have any context for what's going on. <laughs> I, well, because like I wasn't, I wasn't as worried as it maybe seemed like I was in my reply. Oh no, it didn't seem like you were worried. It just seemed like you were like not wagging your finger at me, but like you 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 carry yourself in a very professional way, and I obviously fucking don't. And so <laughs> when you came at me in your professional like. I was like, oh, I fucked up. Oh, oh no. <laughs> One of the things about your show that like trips me out every time I hear it is that your guests will say it all the time. You've said it all the time where like you start reading American poets and then you feel bad and you stop <laughs> and then you start reading <laughs> Australian poets. But I never hear. So first off, that's really weird. And I don't understand what the 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 national like guilt of that is. And then second, why does it seem that Australians don't have that from like the UK and stuff like that? I think our relationship to the UK is one of like mother England and and we don't really want to talk to mom anymore. But America is like cool older brother, you know, he's got like a motorbike and a leather jacket and like he's going to take you to the bar when you're underage and just show you a great time. Yeah. So it's just it's just exceptionally seductive and it's it's impossible to overstate how soaked in american culture australia is yeah every part of our media is pretty much like 90 percent american except neighbors neighbors look neighbors great show all right so as far as you because like obviously you can't speak for other people no 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 but how when that guilt comes up like what causes it because you were just like glowing about the cool older brother that was taking you to a bar in a cool leather jacket no i love it but yeah the guilt is that i'm missing out on the work of my local contemporaries you know if i've only read americans for the last year and then i go over to a book launch over in carlton and i run into like poets a b and c and i haven't read any of their shit because i was too busy thinking about you guys it's embarrassing (laughs) <laughs> so it, it so it's a thing not so much like you feel guilty nationally you feel guilty if other people find out that you haven't been reading Australian poets. Yeah. And I think that sort of goes to like a broader thing for me, which is like, I really don't want people to find the holes in my reading. I'm very secretive about that. And I will tend to sort of be like, oh yeah, yeah, that person. Yeah, I totally know who you're talking about. I'm I'm getting better though at saying like, I actually haven't read that person's work and just mm-hmm. like owning it because I'm learning that like everybody has holes in their reading and like, that's okay. Yeah. And if you ever need to feel better about yourself about that, just know that I haven't read anybody. <laughs> like I've read like five people and that's enough for me. And I'm like, but I could just- like those five people a lot. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, like all like ride or die, you know, and that's fine yeah. and everything's mm-hmm. good. So just always go, oh, well, Matt's not fucking well read. Like we're good. <laughs> like I'm fine. I'm fine. I can do this. <laughs> okay. So now do you think the Australian publishing industry kind of fosters the idea that Australians should be reading American authors instead of Australian authors. Does it foster it? Maybe not. I think it is just in the water. Yeah, I I don't think that's an active thing. I think it would just be a case of we just look to the US 
over and over again for so many things and it's just sort of inescapable but it's also not like I would hate for this to come off like I think this is like a a completely bad thing mm-hmm. um I don't think it's really a bad thing at all I I learned so much so so much from the American poets that I read and I, I really really love them it's just just for me personally it's just like I just want to make sure that I also read some Australians. <laughs> um, I did have some other questions though. Okay. Um, as far as what, because I was talking to you a little bit about American privilege as far as a writer goes. What do you think Americans have that they take for granted compared to other places? As writers? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, take for granted. Well, you've got an amazing publishing system that seems like very long and 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 storied history. You've got these like literary figures that are mythical. <laughs> I don't know. You you come from the place where the good stuff gets made, not exclusively, but mm-hmm. like that's your that's your history. That's your literary canon. Like it's yours, and that kind of blows my mind. Mm-hmm. And I'm not, that's not saying like we have anything to, to be ashamed of or we're like lesser or anything, but it's like, I don't know, kind I of center, center of the universe. Hmm. That That's really bizarre to think like that because I've never, ever thought about anything like that before. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So maybe so, it's an outsider perspective thing. Maybe it's not actually real. But that's what I'm saying. It's like, is it like a thing like white privilege? Like, I just never realized it before. Like, is it like (laughs) American writer privilege? You know, like, (laughs) is this something that I should be like going, oh shit, people in other places probably can't do what we do here. But then I'm like thinking, I hear about your scene and everything. And I'm like going, God, that sounds fucking awesome. Like, I would love to have something fucking like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. And I also don't think that there is like, in 2023 there's very little that an australian poet couldn't do that an american poet could do Mm -hmm. i mean everything's totally transnational digital accessible it's all there for everybody really like to to a large degree so probably like 80s and 90s that was probably a much bigger fucking deal absolutely there's this um beautiful story that I learned through uh, uh, a course I did the other month about how a number of Australian poets pulled their money so that they could bring out the American poet Robert Duncan to Mm -hmm. Australia. And like, they just had to scrape together for months to get his plane ticket. And then he got to Sydney and he stayed at their houses and they ferried him back down to Melbourne and all this kind of stuff. And and that story just moves me so much because it's like Robert Duncan is like probably, I think in, in the American canon, like a bit of a, a minor poet. But to these guys, it was like, we're going to bring out Robert Duncan and we're going to talk to him. Yeah. We're going to hear what he has to say, you know, mm-hmm. and you just couldn't do that in 1995 or, or whenever this was. This is even earlier, I think. Yeah. So if there was one poet that you could bring from America over to you right now who would it be joshua megan yeah because he won't answer my emails <laughs> that's not why <laughs> he does eventually sometimes answer my emails no god i just i just so want to meet josh and i've only ever like i've done so many classes with him on zoom now this mm. is a totally selfish answer this has nothing to do with any benefit <laughs> for anyone else i just want to meet him mm. and uh and just hang out with him and and see what it's like to talk to him not through a screen so do the gofundme set it up and like then wherever you guys have your weddings that you guys have and go to (laughs) you could have them go and speak and read and do all that stuff and then you can make a killing split it with them and then send him (laughs) on his way right yeah i'm trying to think if there's a an answer that wouldn't just be about my own preferences i do think that the poet eileen miles would be pretty great but but they came out here a couple of years ago like that's the other thing too like this is not difficult people come here all the time and you know i hope that i'll be going to new york later this year and mm-hmm. hopefully i will meet josh and hopefully i won't embarrass the shit out of myself <laughs> i'm sure you won't and you just we'll saved yourself a plane ticket that's like, right yeah that's that's how you do it before we wrap this up like you sent me some poems oh i did i forgot about that yeah oh. were, you, were you gonna read any of these Oh, shit. I didn't. I wasn't sure what we were doing with that. Yeah, let me get one up. Okay. Uh, I'm going to make a hell of an editing job for you here. I loved Brief Histories. 
I thought that was oh amazing. shit that's the one I'm most afraid of but this is the Matt Wall podcast and we don't get afraid here <laughs> yeah this so this poem I really don't think is finished because I'm not happy with how it lands how it ends oh, okay I um I feel like at the moment all my poems are like little paper planes like they they start you know they're flying and then they just nosedive well I seem tell to have me lost the ability to like that. land a poem what does a poem need to do for it to land for you I think especially with a poem this short, it can't just trail off. It needs to have some kind of like decisive point of impact. And I think at the moment it ends a little bit in a state of uncertainty. Wow, I'm really, I'm really talking this up. Like this is really going to give me a lot of like. No, seriously. People buying I, my books. <laughs> I totally, I totally felt that it does do that though. Right. Okay, great. Well, I'm not off base there. Do you want me to just read it? So it's not like a, a mystery. No, I think we should keep it. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, definitely read it. <laughs> okay. Well, just promise me that no one that I know personally will ever hear this. I mean, we're at the end of the long podcast conversation, so it's the only private space left <laughs> on the internet. Okay. Brief histories. Dan was half my size. We shared an office. I loved him. Now he lives in Castle, Maine. Shane and I watched movies on a Wednesday. He cried a lot at Brooklyn. Then he left. Jonathan got married really quickly. He didn't want me coming to the wedding. Shelley cooked. We smoked her cigarettes. She doused the pack with water in the morning. Mon lived on a farm and drove a manual. We spent the summer arguing in bed. Stu and I spent 20 years pretending before he pushed me up against a wall. I'm not sure why I'm telling you all this. I guess I hope it saves us both some time. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I just don't know what to do with the end. Because <laughs> it's a sonnet, right? So I've only got like two lines at the end that I like to do something with. So, yeah. No, like, I think it's great. I think it's really, really strong. And it, oh, thanks, Matt. Because you just start reading it and it's just like, oh, this, it, it almost feels like a list. You're just like going through it and it's like, you're, you're not even sure why these things are being said. And then as <laughs> it keeps going, you're like, oh my God. Oh my God. And then like, it's at the very, and you're like, oh my God, this is like, if this is too much for you, you got to take a fucking hike now kind of thing. You right. Know okay. That is kind of what I was going for with the last line. So great. I guess that's good to know. Yeah. Landing. Okay. No. Yeah, for sure. I was just like, fuck. Yeah, no, that's, Thanks. that's really good. Thank you. Okay. And so where, where's that poem from? I wrote it like, in Josh's workshop about four months ago. Is it in yeah. anything? No, 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 no. Floating around in my drafts folder. Do you have a ton of stuff in your drafts folder? Um, I've got about maybe 10 or 12 poems that I'm kind of flipping between. I know that you use Scrivener as well. Mm -hmm. Oh, do you like... use it? Yeah, yeah, I love oh, it. I love it. It's, it's, so it's particularly good. good for poetry, I think. Yeah, because mm -hmm. you can just get to a point with one where I'm like, I can't do anything with you. I am so sick of you. And then you just jump to the... Do you yeah, use like all the like revision tabs and all the stuff that you could do with it? No, no. I probably use it in the most basic and like I totally do too. not useful I, way. Yeah. Like I, there's like a million buttons in Scrivener and I use three, yeah. you know? So yeah, it's yeah, like. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> well, otherwise you're just meta fiddling, right? Like you should yeah. be writing, not fiddling with your Scrivener Exactly. Yeah. For real. Oh yeah. man. But if you wanted to fiddle, Scrivener is definitely yeah, cool. the. Oh, there's so much you can do there. It's so much fun. So the last thing I wanted to talk to you about was when I said earlier that I think you are the most famous poet in Australia and you started <laughs> laughing like you are right now. <laughs> Why is that funny to you? Oh, because I'm so not. I mean, I'm so not. I just am so not. There's like really fucking famous people with huge awards and like, I mean, I don't know. I'm just not that famous. I don't... I'm well, not famous I'm... at all. <laughs> See, I was just going to say, I'm glad you said not that. And then you're like, no, not at all. Not at all. Okay, no, no, I, I want to remind you something. Not. You sent me a poem a while ago. Okay. Do you remember this? Oh, yes. Oh, you're going to John Berryman me. <laughs> I'm going to John Berryman you. Oh, God. I walked into that. 
<laughs> um, so do you remember um, Dream Song 342? I do. What a great poem. Such a banger. Yeah. I'm going to read a little bit of this. Oh, okay? no. <laughs> and I want you to think of yourself while I Aww. read this. <laughs> okay. Um, fan mail from foreign countries. Is that fame? Imitations and parodies in your own translations. Most of the relevant prizes, your private name splashed on page one with a photograph alone, or you with your lovely wife. Interviews on television and radio on various continents. Can that be fame? Henry could not find out. Before he left the ship at Cobb, he was photographed. I don't know how they knew he was coming. He said as little as possible. They wanted to know whether his sources of inspiration might now be Irish. I cried out, of course, and waved him off with my fountain pen. The tender left the liner and healed, or headed for shore. Cobb, or Cove, pronounced Cove, approached. Our luggage was ready, and anonymously, we went into customs. A lone letter from a young man. That is fame. So, you famous Australian poet, you. <laughs> what a beautiful sentiment. That's really lovely of you, Matt. No, um, it's true. Yeah. And just all, but like you were like beyond your words, your podcast has definitely left or made a mark in Australia if publishers are hitting you up asking you to interview these people and you're the one now rejecting everybody <laughs> you know, you're like I don't want to fucking interview that asshole fuck you <laughs> you know what I'm saying like you Look, are you're kind of a gatekeeper now oh no you're a kingmaker Oh no. And I'm not saying this to like make you like all like, oh, this is the worst conversation I've ever had. <laughs> I'm saying this because like I feel like you have the ability to like do some amazing stuff. You know what I'm saying? You could be right. You could be right. It's a lot of responsibility. I think the thing that I would say though about that poem is like that that last line. Is it a lone letter from a let me get it? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just alone. Like, alone. Yeah. Just, just the getting that one letter, like, you know, I don't get letters, but occasionally I'll get like an email. And yeah, you when get you emails get emails from drunk douchebags in LA. <laughs> <laughs> and when you get that email, like particularly when it's somebody you've never heard from before mm -hmm. and he's like, I just found your podcast and I really like it. Like, it just feels so great. Yeah. Cause you're just like, oh, thanks. Like, it's just so good to hear, you know, that it, that it actually does that thing that podcasts were doing for me back in London when I was like so fucking lonely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, just no, totally in your ears. Yeah, and it's not just that. Like, like I've learned a ton of stuff from your show. You know, just like <laughs> like I didn't really know Berryman before your show. You know what yeah. I'm saying? Yeah, and like, that, yeah. Like it's just it's awesome. Like you do a really great job. Oh, thank you. The Berryman one where I used a whole bunch of Britney Spears stems is one that I, I would recommend if listeners would like to go and, and hear more. It's called yeah. Solace and Trash. And it was really like something of a kind of a mental breakdown in audio form. <laughs> so enjoy. <laughs> Your salesmanship is exquisite. So I know, I'm that, really bad. <laughs> you're killing it. You're like, hey, you guys should listen to, to this. I completely, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're doing awesome. You're doing awesome. And honestly, I never would have um, known anything about Halsey if it wasn't for you. So, oh, Halsey's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Love her. Mm. That was that was really fun. Okay, so I wanted to know, out of those poems that you sent, what one do you like the best? Oh, what one do I like the best? This is this is great. I've been listening to you talk about this thing of like you just not being a terrible judge of your own work. Um, what one do I like the best? All I can see are the flaws. I'll tell you the one that I most care about is this rewriting of Horace. 
Um, okay. I so badly want to get that right and to get it published somewhere. Uh, it's nowhere near that, but like that, the original Horace poem is, is so wonderful and it means a lot to me. And yeah, I, I would love to, to get that one right. Do you want to read this? No, <laughs> I really don't. I really don't. <laughs> Let's let it live in the imagination. All right. <laughs> the, so... the first one though, um, called High Resolve was uh, one that I wrote for Josh's first workshop that I did with him. And he did tell me that he read it and then he yelled out to his wife, like, come and listen to this. That's <laughs> and awesome. that is like the biggest, best compliment I've ever gotten. Yeah. Do you want to read that? Let me read that one just okay. so I can stop fucking around and being so <laughs> silly. Okay. All right. So this is called High Resolve. So I taught myself to run again, again. It's all about the playlist, plus the way the cold forgives us, given time. I say good morning, like I mean it. All the Zen one would expect. I'm new. I'm good. Wise men are worried for my knees. I have today, exactly like I did before. And pray forever and forever, girl. Amen. Running can't fix everything, I'll grant you. I still remember too much and regret the bulk of it. Still, here's what humans do. Fuck up, resolve, get better, then forget. Above the trail, a wayward cockatoo, her screeching, my panting, some duet. Very nice. So yeah, Josh liked that and I was like, fuck yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so did you change anything of that after he said he liked it? Uh, yeah, I think the the final two lines, again, I'm not 100% sure that they're totally right. I think there was some tiny change, like maybe ah to some or something like that. So how do but you yeah. know when a poem's right? Yeah, it's such a great question. I, I had a, a woman who ran a writing group that I was in for a little while said that she knows when it's done, when it sits quietly on the page. I thought that was lovely. Some poems you just you want to keep fiddling with. I have one at the moment that I've just fiddled with for 18 months and it's getting worse every single time. And my problem is I never keep drafts. So the original is fucking gone. Why do you <laughs> so do that? Mad. I know. This is like your nightmare, right? You can <laughs> add pages under the page in Scrivener of I the know. original poem. I know. I'm crazy, but see, every time, because the ego, right? I'm like, I can make this better. I can make it work. And I can't. <laughs> Now, are you sure that it's actually getting worse each time? Yeah, because I'm less and less and less satisfied with it. And the problems that it has are getting bigger, not smaller. And uh, yeah, it's like- Have you ever tried to re rewrite the original poem from memory? I should do that. I do have some memory of what the original was like maybe i have a draft somewhere in gmail i'll i'll look for it i'm gonna look for it <laughs> i know that that one had problems too but like they're not as big as the problem is now which totally proves your thing about like how revision is like can be just an evil evil practice i don't know i um i don't know if i talked about this but after i think it was after i did the Slee ricketts episode with uh, matthew and cameron like um, some of the things actually Cameron said to me kind of um, stuck out to me. And I was like, oh, okay, well, now I'm going to write this poem and I'm going to look at it and then I'm going to rewrite a couple parts of it that I don't really love that much. Whoa, that's, and then a, I, that's a transformation. I, yeah. And so I rewrote a couple lines and I was like, I felt like a liar. I felt oh, like, but okay. not to anyone other than me. Like, I felt like I wasn't being true to me. I felt like mm -hmm. I, like, I felt like I cut myself, bled on the page and then said, my blood's not worth it and mm -hmm. needed to like kind of mop it up and then try to cut myself again and bleed again. It's a, it's a silly analogy, but like, that was the kind of thought. And then I felt like afterwards, I'm like, well, I did what he said to do and I felt dirty doing it. and so. He's not buying me dinner, so that's all the dirty I'm going to do from that. <laughs> you know? But it felt it felt artificial, like I, is it what just, I hear you saying. Felt, like, yeah, it just felt 
weird. And it, it's like, <clears throat> but I think a lot of it has to do with someone's like, like their ritual when they go into it and they create, you know, cause like some people like the ritual, like I had um, a student of mine who like could not not revise like he had to revise mm -hmm. everything because he felt like if he wasn't doing that that he wasn't creating he wasn't sculpting and I'm like well if that's how you feel and that's how you do your thing then do your thing you know mm -hmm. I'm just telling you how I do my thing you know and if this doesn't work for you then by all means do what you do you know and yeah yeah so that's what I hear you sort of saying bottom line is like just figure out what works for you and do that. Yeah. You know, you give a lot of instruction and practical advice, but I feel like underneath it all is this sense of like just do the thing that works. Yeah, underneath it all like I just want people to create stuff. Like creation is so much fun and it's so exhilarating and like being a mad scientist and like putting together a Frankenstein monster, you know, like whenever you get an opportunity to do that, it is riveting you know what i'm saying so any time anyone can do that i'm all about you know like i don't want to like yell at people like i want to yell at the people who yelled at me you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. so like of course i want to like stand on a rooftop and scream like an idiot but at the same time if you're doing something then don't listen to a fucking thing i'm saying and just keep doing what you're doing you know mm -hmm. so that's that that's that That was so much fun. We talked about so much more stuff that I didn't get to put in this. And I think I'm going to save little parts of this for a future episode I'm putting together that's about politics and poetry. Um, we hit a few different things that fell into that category quite nicely. So I think I'm going to throw those in there. Now, I want you guys to remember your mom. And no, it's not Mother's Day, but it might as well should be. Yeah. So again... Winner, your mom's sodomy prize for poetry. The pre-order crowdfunding campaign with all sorts of cool crap. Down below the links. Please take a look at it. You don't even have to decide now. Let me sell you on it. Come into my shoppy and I will show you the wares. Okay? And then you will be, oh my gosh, I need to do this. And I will be, yes you do. But there's another thing that I want to talk to you guys about. And that is the Poetic Anarchy Scavenger Hunt. Yes, it is this Thursday, which while you're hearing this, it'll be tomorrow. If you hear this in time, send me an email to ihatematwall.gmail.com and say you want to be in. Because this time and how we're doing this in the future, you need to let me know ahead of time and I will let you in. Okay? Because once you once we start, the doors are shut and the vibe rules the roost. Okay? So there's going to be a workshop, a scavenger hunt, and some open mic, okay? So make sure you're there. It'll probably be Thursday around 4 o'clock, give or take. Um, that time seemed to work out okay last time. Um, we'll see if the time works out okay this time. And if it does, great. If not, we could change it later. But that's what the thing is. So Thursday, March 2nd. 4 p.m. Pacific time, the scavenger hunt, okay? We had a lot of fun with it last time. And also, if you wanted to do my workshop for the Endless Poem, we did that last Friday with the Anarchy crew, and it worked out wonderfully. Basically, what it is, is you are going to write a chapbook in one city, okay? You could put it out if you want. You could throw it away if you want. But doing this thing, you will have enough material for a chapbook that you can put out yourself or send out to see if any other companies want to put it out for you, okay? So if you're interested in that and you want to actually see my face when you listen to these podcasts, go to the link down below, go over to YouTube, join the Anarchy Crew, and you get over 100 videos of lessons and workshops and things of that nature, plus you get members-only live streams every Friday, okay? Like, there's all sorts of cool crap, and you get to do the Endless Poem, which I think is... An amazing thing and i'm going to be doing a lot more of it now all right so with that said please don't forget about your mom she will guilt the crap out of you if you do those are the butt plugs i i, I can't do more butt plugs than that but seriously folks run over to the indiegogo and fund this crowd okay so we can get our fingers all over your mom do the thing type hard everyone and i will talk to you all Later.
I just want to give a quick thanks to those people who make these videos possible. Anarchy Crew and my followers on Patreon. I appreciate the hell out of you guys. And thank you so much for keeping me going to keep this content possible. You guys are awesome. And if you'd like to join the crew or the Anarchy Crew, just hit the join button beneath this video. And if you'd like to become a member of my Patreon, you can run over to the link down below to do that as well. Thank you.